all who honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. Uh, he, he who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, who, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. Uh, and then let's go to Acts. I just want to re reconfirm what it says. Uh, Peter says it later on. If you go to Acts chapter 10. Verse 42, Acts chapter 10 at verse 42. All right, so here, uh, just to give you some context, uh, Peter, uh, Cornelius has, has this vision. He calls upon Peter. Peter shows up, um, and Peter is kind of telling Cornelius, and Cornelius and the people who are with Cornelius, like, hey, um, you guys are Gentiles. God has revealed to me that, um, uh, that, that Christ's message is not just for the Jews, but it's for the Gentiles also. Uh, but just here at verse 42, yep, verse 42. And he ordered us to preach to the people and solemnly to testify that this is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. Of him, all the prophets bear witness that through his name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sin. And really the, the, the point that I'm trying to tie back to Nehemiah is, is just showing Nehemiah's spiritual maturity um, in knowing that uh, uh God will vindicate those who, who, who are against his people, uh, but we can also know that um, Christ is the perfect judge um, and that we, can, we, we should have that or have an understanding and have confidence in, in, that, same, in that same promise, um, that Christ is the perfect judge and God appointed him as the perfect judge. Uh, okay, all right. Uh, so that covers that part, and then we'll go in. Uh, I'll, I'll read verse 9 through, uh, I'll, I'll just carry out to the rest of Nehemiah chapter 4, uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about uh, what I read, and then we'll go into chapter 5. Uh, and for those, I'm reading the, the New American Standard Bible, uh, so if, if it sounds a little funny, it's because I think they try to, word for word, what, what it says in Hebrew and Greek, they try to word for word pair it with, with English words. So sometimes when, when I read the, I, I have two Bibles that I use. I use this one, and then I use like a New Living Translation, which is kind of the same speech that we use today. Uh, but the NASB one, it, it, it tries to go word for word. So sometimes when you read stuff, I'm like, what is it trying to say? Because it doesn't make any sense. So I have to go look at another Bible and be like, all right, this is what it's trying to tell me. All right, so beginning at uh, verse 9 of chapter 4. But we prayed to our God, and because of them, we set up a guard against them day and night. Thus in Judah it was said, the strength of the burden bearers is failing, yet there is so much rubbish, and we ourselves are unable to rebuild the wall. Our enemies said, they will not know or see until we come among them, kill them and put a stop to the work. When the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times, they will come up against us from every place where you may turn. Then I stationed men in the lowest parts of the space behind the wall, the exposed places, and I stationed the people and families with their swords, spears, and bows. When I saw their fear, I rose and spoke to the nobles and the officials and the rest of the people. Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome, and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. When our enemies heard that it was known to us, and that God had frustrated their plan, then all of us returned to the wall, each one to his work. From that day on, half of my servants carried on the work, while half of them held the spears, the shields, the bows, and the breastplates, and the captains were behind the whole house of Judah. Those who were rebuilding the wall, and those who carried burdens, took their load with one hand doing the work, and the other holding a weapon. As for the builders, each wore his sword girded at his side as he built, while the trumpeters stood near me. I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, The work is great and extensive, and we are separated on the wall far from one another. At whatever place you hear the sound of the trumpet, rarely to, uh, rally to us there, our God will fight for us. So we carried on the work with half of them holding spears from dawn until the stars appeared. At that time I also said to the people, Let each man with his servant spend the night within Jerusalem, so that they may be a guard for us by night, and a laborer by day. So neither I, my brothers, my servants, nor the men of the guard who followed me, none of us removed our clothes, each took his own weapon, even to the water. Um, so what we see here is, is Sanballat and his, and his crew, uh, the original people, I won't say the original, but the people who were living there when, when Jerusalem was ransacked, um, you know, their, their initial... Uh, reaction to the Jews coming back and starting to rebuild is, you know, they kind of start making fun of them. 
But then they start seeing progress. Because if you remember, uh, I didn't read this portion, but in the beginning of chapter 4, they start building the wall about halfway up. And I think I, I did some research, and the average height of the wall was like 29 to, to 36 feet. So it's, it's pretty huge. Um, and the fact that they've gone halfway through, you can tell that they're starting to get worried. They're like, wait a minute. Uh, you know, they're making progress. Um, you know, we need to do something about it. We can't just make fun of them anymore. Um, and as you can see, they, they, their, their threats turn into acts of violence, or at least a, a, a attempted a acts of violence. Now, something that I found funny here is that it took Nehemiah 10 times to hear from the people, like, hey, these guys want to kill us, for him to actually, like, do something about it. Um, I, you know, I, the, the context of that, I don't know. I don't know if, you know, if, if they were crying wolf and, he, you know, he just, like, okay, whatever. They, you know, they, they complain to me all the time. But I find it funny that it says, by the end of the 10th time, I was like, all right, we got to do something about it. Um, but anyways, I, I just thought that was kind of funny. Uh, but one thing I, I did notice, uh, or that I... Let's see, where was it? Is that it, note, it says in here, when our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had frustrated their plan, then all of us returned to the wall, each one to his own work. Uh, what I found interesting is that um, even the enemy knew God's hand was, was with the Jews. Um, and what I forgot to do is I forgot to look up a proverb, but it says something along, and I'm going to paraphrase it and probably butcher it, but it says that... Um, God will essentially help those out. Like, well, I'm trying to remember. So, something along the lines of your enemies will even begin to, 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 to acknowledge your, or to, to acknowledge God through your actions. Um, I butchered it. I'll, I'll, I'll have to look it up later on. But it's, it's something along those lines. Um, but I do find it interesting that, that, e that you know, that the enemies of, uh, of the Jews understood that, that God was with them. Um, and that we'll see that they'll, they'll kind of start to shrink back and not, and, and not carry out with their threats. Um, and another thing here is that uh, I'm going to read a note that I heard from uh, Charles Stanley, who's a, a pretty popular uh, uh, Bible teacher or uh, preacher. And he wrote, talking about Nehemiah, when, when Nehemiah gathers the people around to, to pray, he says, Despite moments of doubt and unease, Nehemiah demonstrated great faith in God. Driven by a vision that he believed came from God, he dared to trust in the sovereign Lord who always keeps his promises. Nehemiah told the people, the God of heaven will give us success, therefore we as servants will arise and build. And that was in chapter 2. Uh, Nehemiah, under, Nehemiah understood that if he didn't depend on God to get the job done, it would never get done. But he also understood that genuine belief requires practical action. So he told his colleagues, remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers. Um, and I, when I was thinking, all right, you know, Nehemiah pretty much saying, you know, remember the Lord. Uh, because back in chapter 1, when, when Nehemiah is praying, when he first hears stories about, hey, Jerusalem has fallen apart, uh, he quotes uh, from Scripture. And he paraphrased it here in chapter 1, if you go back to chapter 1 of verse, uh, verse 8. Uh, and it says, remember the word which you commanded your servant Moses saying, if you're unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though those of you who have been scattered were in the most remote, remote parts of the heavens, I will gather them from there and will bring them to the place where I've chosen to cause my name to dwell. They are your servants and your people whom you redeem by your great power and by your strong hand. And again, that came from the same, uh, the same book of Deuteronomy a little bit earlier than, than chapter 32. Uh, but Nehemiah is drawing on, on God's promise uh, that though he will scatter the, 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 uh, the Jewish nation, that where they are gathered together, he will bring them back, as long as they come back in, in true faith. Uh, and again, there's, there's multiple promises of God, and we can always, you know, Chuck Swindle always says, you know, find a promise in the Bible and claim it. I don't know what, I, like, <clears throat> I've never understood what he means by that, just because I've never studied the promises of, of God. Um, I don't know, maybe that's a Wednesday night thing that we can do in, in the future, but uh, Nehemiah understood that, that that was a promise that, that, that through Moses that, that God gave. Um, and we could just do that ourselves today. Like, you know, nothing has changed. What, what God says he's going to do is, you know, is never changing. He will fulfill his promises. Um, and he does it time and time again through, throughout the Bible. Uh, but that's all I have for chapter four. Any questions or anything I missed that you think?
Pastor Jeff? Yeah, it's it's kind of it's kind of funny, like how sometimes you read things and for whatever reason it doesn't. Yeah, and then when you start studying other stuff, you know, it, you're like, oh, like how come I never caught that? I've read, you know, we've all read the book. Many of us have read the book of John numerous times, and you just, you know, I don't know. But uh, It does. Pretty remarkable. All right. Uh, we'll go into chapter 5. All right. Uh, if I could have someone, <clears throat> let's split this up because it's kind of long. Let's do, if someone can read chap, or chapter 5, verse 1 through 8, and then someone, out, someone else finish out 9 to um, 13. All right, thank you. Someone can carry out 9 to 13. All right, so the wor first word that popped out to me when I was reading this, and you said it correctly, uh, Kelly, because I was pronouncing it incorrectly. Then Jenny corrected me, and then this morning, um, I was like, well, what does the English dictionary say? And the word is usury. Um, I was pronouncing it like usury or something like that. I'd, I'd never seen the word in my life. Um, but it's U-S-U-R-Y, and does anyone know what that means? Yes, that's what it is. I didn't know what it was either, so I had to look it up. But yes, what usury is, is a, a charging a large amount of interest on a loan. Um, and what it is, is so I wrote down the definitions. Uh, with the, I have a Bible encyclopedia, and it, it kind of gave it like this. Sum of money charged for a loan. Old Testament laws prohibited a Jew from charging another Jew usury, but permitted it when money was loaned to a Gentile. Uh, although the word was, has negative connotations to it, uh, today, it was not so in biblical days when usury simply was the interest charged for a loan. Excessive usury was condemned. 
So uh, when, I, when I was reading, I was like, okay, well, well why is it bad uh, to have others in debt for, you know, like within their own people? I was like, oh, you know, a debt is a debt, and, you, you know, there's probably some interest charged to it. But the purpose that I, I thought was because God wanted, God wants to separate himself from others. And by doing that, he used the Jewish nation essentially to show that to the world, to say, hey, these are my people, and these are the laws that I have enacted. So if you, so I'll go to it for this time, but we have a, a, other verses that we'll get to. I'm going to read where that started from, and again, it's in Deuteronomy. Uh Chapter 23, this is where God commands that usury. He, he doesn't use the term usury, but he just pretty much says, don't be charging your folks loans. All right, you shall not charge interest to your countrymen, interest on money, food, or anything that may be loaned at interest. You may charge interest to a foreigner. But to your countrymen you shall not charge interest, so that the Lord your God may bless you in all that you undertake, in the land which you are about to enter to possess. So again, God was was really trying to show a perfect kingdom through through the through the Israelites, through through the Jewish nation, um, and how how you know how bad it would have looked if if His own people were charging each other like ex- exorbitant amount of prices and enslaving their own people because now you know this person really couldn't pay off their debt anymore. So now you know. They didn't look. They didn't look any different from from the world. Um, and again, God wants us. To, well, God wants to separate Himself from others. Uh, if we can go to Deuteronomy chapter seven, and verses six to eleven. Now, just what I wanted to do as I, as I started wondering. Okay, God wants to separate the Israelite nation from the others. I started pulling up just uh, p- points of scripture where God verbally says that. Like, this is why, this is why I'm doing this. I, I guess I wanted to show the why of why he wanted to, to, to separate the Jewish nation from the rest of the world. Um, Jenny, can, are you there right now? Uh, chapter 7. And then verse 6 to 11. Thanks, babe. So, again, nothing special that, that, that the Israelites did or the Jewish nation did. N- nothing special about them, right? They weren't the, the they weren't the biggest. They weren't the most handsomest. God just chose them, um, and it's kind of humbling that that God chooses that you know God chooses us to be um, to be Christians and, and and be a part of his of his um, of his kingdom. Um, and what I found even more astonishing is, is someone could go to Second uh, Samuel chapter seven, verse twenty-three and twenty-four, and then if someone else can go to Exodus nineteen, verse five to six. Second Samuel chapter seven, verse twenty-three to twenty-four, and then if someone else can take Exodus chapter nineteen, verse five to six. You'll take the Exodus, all right? And then Pastor Jeff, you got Samuel. All right, before Pastor Jeff reads, reads that, that portion from Samuel, um, no, I, I, actually go ahead and read it, and then I'll say it after. 23 to 24, two verses. All 
All right, so right there in verse 23 where it says, himself as a people to make a name for himself. So that's, that's the purpose of the Jewish nation is for God to make a name for himself, for the people outside to see the, the, the Jewish nation blessed because you know, they follow God's commandments. You know, they're, they're supposed to be a nation set apart. Um, and what I was going to say about David, I was telling Jenny this morning, is that you know, there's, uh, b- before Jenny and I even got married, I already had three, three names for boys picked out, and the first one was David. Uh, and that's because when I was a you know, I became a Christian when I was 16 years old, um, and uh, you know, I started reading through the Bible, and like the first character of the Bible that, that I really, really enjoyed was, was David. Um, you know, he was just kind of a wild man. Uh, he was, you know, a man after God's own heart. He made, you know, a lot of mistakes. Um, but at the end of the day, he, you know, he was still obedient to God. Um, and I just kind of thought that was kind of, you know, admirable. Um, and, and, and how human David is. He, he's, you know, he's... Like he's he's no different than any of us in this room. So, you know who your favorite boy was? Joshua. And then? Joseph. Yeah. So those are the three names that I had picked out. And then you know with Lily, uh, well I won't get into that. But we got her name from Matthew, from uh, chapter six in Matthew, the lilies of the field. Uh, but anyways, uh, you know just uh, with David, how how human he is, uh, but yet. You know, when he writes the Psalms, you probably didn't even know, but a lot of those Psalms were, you know, are prophetic. Um, but then, you know, you read this in this chapter, chapter 7 of Samuel, then two chapters later, he has the affair with Bathsheba. So uh, it's just, you know, again, it just shows how human he is, but, but yet God still, you know, still loves people like him, people like us. Um, anyways. All right, and then Exodus, uh, Ellen, please. Uh, five to six, please. So again, through Moses, showing, hey, this is the purpose of Israel, right? To be a kingdom, a kingdom of priests. And I read that this morning. I was like, man, what? Do, you know, that's kind of funny. Like, well, we're supposed to be a kingdom of priests because I, you know, grew up at the Catholic Church. I have a different view set of priests. Um, but, uh, but so I looked up priests. Like, what exactly is a priest? And in my own words, I wrote, priest equals in charge of sacrifices and offerings, and a mediator uh, for God, right? And that was what through you know through through the Levites through through the line of Aaron, um, and then I realized you know Jesus is always you know Jesus is the high priest. So I looked up two verses um, talking about Jesus as the high priest. And if someone could go to Hebrews chapter nine, a lot of Bible drills today, guys. Hebrews chapter nine. Clyde, can you take Hebrews chapter nine, uh, verse eleven and fifteen? And then, um, if someone can take First Peter, chapter two, and we'll do verse five to twelve. We'll start with the Hebrew one first. Uh, verse eleven and fifteen.
All right, thank you. So again, Christ is the high priest. He is the high priest. Um, and he is the mediator between God and us. Um, again, j just confirming what, what, what a high priest is. And then going back to, uh, in the Old Testament, God wanting to separate the nation of Israel. But now God wants to separate us from the world. Right? We as Christians, we are supposed to be uh, that example to the world of how we should act. And then also act with, with one another here as, as our Christian brothers and sisters. And then if someone could read, uh, th thank you, Clyde. If someone can read 1 Peter chapter 2, and that's verse 5 to 12. Thanks, Terry. All right, so nothing's really changed from from the Old Testament to you know to today. Um, and if you look the at verse nine, that's essentially what Moses said in Exodus. Uh, you know, you are a chosen race, a royal a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. That's us. That's us as Christians. When Christ came back, he you know that abolished or he fulfilled the laws, but essentially we didn't have to you know follow them word for word because Christ came. And, and that's it, you know. Christ is, is the mediator. He bridges the great divide between human and, 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 and the heavens. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we ourselves are supposed to live a, a, that, that, that holy life. Um, anyway, so I put set apart from the world. That's the whole main purpose of, 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 the, of chapter 5, that section that we just read. Um, Jews were already enslaved by Babylonians and Persians. The Jews were released, and their actions and attitudes hadn't changed. Um, it, it's as if the Jews had become like the rest of the world. Um, and I think that's what, that's what bothered Nehemiah, because he knew what right looked like. He knew that, hey, you know, you know we've been freed, right? The, the 70 years of being enslaved by, by the Babylonians is complete. Uh, we're supposed to set, you know, start building the, the, the kingdom of God back up in Jerusalem. Um, but when he showed up and he saw what was going on, you know, it was like, well, there's really no difference between Babylonians, Persians, and the Jews. That's not, that's not the way it's supposed to be. And that's not, that's not how we as Christians are supposed to live our lives as well. Um, we were to look as Christ. Uh, so I'll read this part. Uh, I'm going to read Colossians chapter, where, where some of the, uh, I think Paul talks about this. Um, I'm going to read from Colossians. You can follow along if you want. Colossians chapter 4, verse 5 to 6. Well, I'm, I'm going to ask you guys something. Do you guys know like the little, the funny acronym for, for uh, figuring out where like Ephesians, uh, Colossians, like all those little things are? So, so Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians, um, huh? Oh, I'm sorry, Philippians. It's Gentiles eat pork chops. I don't know. If, Uh, so that's that's how I always remember where to find like those funny ones because you have Rome right it goes Acts Romans and then the first and second letter to the Corinthians and then like after that you just kind of like oh man like where are the rest of the letters because they're kind of small like the you know so Gentiles eat pork chops that's how I remember where Galatians is where Ephesians is where uh, Philippians and Colossians are anyways after that 
Uh, I think it's, yeah, I forget what it is. I think it was it this. Yeah, anyways. All right, Colossians chapter 4, <laughs> verse 5 to 6. Con and this is Paul. Conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. So again, conducting ourselves as Christ towards others in order to make, you know, an opportunity. And then Ephesians chapter 5. The eat. No, it's the eat. It's the eat of, of Gentiles eat pork chops. All right. And that was actually from our pastor in Kansas who told us that. It was kind of funny. <laughs> All right. Verse 1 through 4. Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. And walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. But immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you, as is uh, proper among saints. And there must be no filthiness and silly talk or co coerced jesting, which I struggle with, which are not fitting, but rather a giving of thanks. For this you know with certainty that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. So again, going back to how we should live, that's, you know, we need to be that shining example. Was it the, the beacon on a hill? Um, that's what Christ says in, in, in the Gospels. Uh, we're supposed to draw people towards us um, by the way we live, by the way we treat each other. You know, by the way, I talk to, to Don or Pastor Jeff or Chris or my wife. Um, and one last thing I was going to talk about, I don't know if we have time to cover it. It's called the year of Jubilee, and we don't have enough time to cover it. Huh? Well, I mean, I, I'm going to want to get some water and kind of, uh, <laughs> yeah, take a break. Um, year of Jubilee. The year of Jubilee is, is supposed to write, like, all these loans, right? So let's say if these guys were practicing, you know, usury, this should have ended, you know, six years ago. And from, from what I read in the scripture, I don't think the Jewish nation ever practiced the year of Jubilee. I never saw it. So if you guys don't know what the year of Jubilee is, let's, let's look at Leviticus chapter 25. And I'll explain to you why, why this, you know, there's a reason for, for its importance. It's so that the people wouldn't, they wouldn't enslave their own people. Like there was a law that, or a, a celebration that God enacted in order to prevent, you know, the, the Jewish nation from, from enslaving themselves. And as I started, you know, looking into this, I was like, man, I don't know if, you know, because you have the Feast of Booths, you have all these other feasts going on, right? Feast of Unleavened Bread. Well, then there's this year of Jubilee that's, that's kind of sticks out there, but no one ever practices it because it's really, a, it's of no benefit to the, well, it's of, I say no benefit of the Jewish people, but it, it, it is a benefit. Um, and I think it's just because people just get greedy. I think that's what it is. Um, man, I, it's a long chapter to read. I'll, I'll start reading a, a little bit of it. All right, so beginning at verse 1. The Lord then spoke to Moses at Mount Sinai, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I shall give you, then the land shall have a Sabbath to the Lord. Six years you shall sow your field, and six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather in its crop. But during the seventh year the land shall have a Sabbath rest, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall not sow your field nor prune your vineyard. Your harvest after growth you shall not reap, and your grapes of untrimmed vines you shall not gather. The land shall have a sabbatical year. Now, Terry, why do you think that is? As a farmer, like you would probably understand this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly what it is, yeah. I didn't know that until I looked it up. I was like, why, you know, how come we're not going to work at that, that seventh year? But it's, well, well, that's one reason is because of that. But the second reason, I think, is, is, is showing faith that God will provide for you still in that seventh year, right? Because you, when you read it, you're like, well, how are they going to, you know, like, what are they going to eat for that seventh year? But the idea is that, you know, and, and we'll read it later on where God blatantly says, like, hey, have faith in me. Um, that seventh year, you're going to have more than enough. And if you don't, I will still provide for you. So it's twofold. One is to, you know, the crop rotation, like you said, and the other one is it, it, it shows faith in God. 
Um, and again, that's you know people seeing that on the outside, they'd be like, how come they're not, how come they're not working on that seventh year? Anyways, all right. Um, let's see. All right. And uh, and all of you shall have the Sabbath products of the land for food, yourself and your male and male, female slaves, and your hired man and your foreign resident, those who live as aliens with you. Even your cattle and the animals that are in your land shall have all its crops to eat. You are also to count off seven Sabbaths of years for yourself, seven times seven years, so that you have the time of the seven Sabbaths of years, namely 49 years. So you're to practice this seven times, right? Seven times seven is 49. Um, so then you, you ask yourself, well, what are we going to do on the 50th year? We'll get to it. You shall then sound a ram's horn abroad on the tenth day of the seventh month. On the day of atonement, you shall sound a horn all through, all through your land. You shall thus consecrate the fiftieth year and proclaim a release through the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you, and each of you shall return to his own property, and each of you shall return to his family. You shall have the fiftieth year as a jubilee. You shall not sow nor reap its aftergrowth, nor gather in from its untrimmed vines. For it is a jubilee, it shall be holy to you. You shall eat its crops out of the field. On this year of jubilee, right the fiftieth year, you shall return to his own property. If you make a sale, moreover, to your friend or buy from your friend's hand, you shall not wrong one another. Corresponding to the number of years after the jubilee, you shall buy from your friend. He is to sell to you according to the number of years of crops. In proportion to the extent of the years, you shall increase its price, and in proportion to the fewness, of the years you shall diminish its price, and for, for it is a number of crops he is selling to you. So you shall not wrong one another, but you shall fear your God, for I am the Lord your God. You shall thus observe my statutes and keep my judgments so as to carry them out, that you may live securely on the land. Then the land will yield its produce so that you can eat your fill and live securely on it. So that's essentially your seventh year. Um, but if you say, and this is where, <laughs> I was, when we were camping, I was reading this, and I was reading like, well, what, what do you do on the seventh year if you don't have enough crops? Like, you know, what if you have a bad year, a drought or something the year before, and like, you know, are you stuck? And God answered, he, you know, God answered it through his word. Uh, but if you say, what are we going to eat on the seventh year if we do not sow or gather in our crops? Then I will, so, I will so order my blessing for you in the sixth year that it will bring forth the crop for three years. When you are sowing the eighth year, you can still eat old things from the crop, eating the old until the ninth year when it's uh, the crop. Uh, so... Um, what this is showing is, is that, one, God is caring for his people, but two, um, things are supposed to reset at that 50th year, right? People get their land back. Uh, if you continue reading on in, in the rest of the, of the chapter, those who were like essentially hired hands or, you know, if, if they couldn't afford something, they worked for somebody, they become a slave. At that 50th year, they were released. Like their, their, their debt was done. You know, er, everything started from beginning. All right, you know, you go back. Um, and I just saw that when I was reading that Nehemiah, I was kind of like, you know, no one ever practiced that. You know, I'd, uh, and they still didn't practice it, you know, a afterwards that we know of. You know, I'd, I've never seen anyone saying, hey, this was the year of Jubilee, or, you know. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. You said Ford did that? Yeah. Interesting. Well, uh, that's pretty much all I have. To, I mean, we, we can finish out the rest of chapter 5. Um, and the, the only thing that I, that I got from 14 through, through 19 that if we'll have someone, if someone can read that for us, but um, it just shows what the, the kind of man that Nehemiah was. Um, and again, that's that's because he, you know, he walked with God. Um, he he followed his decrees, and and he was very, in, I think, spiritually in tune uh, to to how the Jews, you know, should be living. And I think he was integral in, in getting them up started and and, and continuing on uh, the legacy of 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 the Israel uh, nation.
Uh, someone could read verse to finish out chapter 5, verse 14 and 19. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, it just shows that Nehemiah is leading from the front, just like he did in chapter 4. He was out there working with them. Uh, he kept on his gear, uh, knowing that the enemy could potentially come and get them. Uh, and then, again, he, he didn't, you know, he could have he could have easily asked more of the people to provide, hey, I want more food, I want more of this, I want more of that. Uh, but he didn't. He took only what, what was needed. Um, and that's something for the church leadership really to, to think about as well. Uh, if I could have someone close this in prayer, please. Amen. All right, any questions? You have the, the offertory prayer today.